Hey y'all, it's Eli with Alchemy Custom Weaponry and we're here at Union Station in Ogden, Utah. And for those of you that may not know, Ogden is the hometown, the birthplace of the greatest firearms designer of all time, John Moses Browning, who of course made the 1911. So we are going to have just an absolutely great time walking through the John Moses Browning Museum. We have an expert, Phil, who's going to be talking with us about some of the coolest guns you'll ever, this will be one of the coolest guns, we, or excuse me, videos that we ever put out. Uh, and I'm just so excited. You'll notice that this is going to be a video that is um, a little bit toned down from the normal alchemy video. We're not going to be cutting up. This is a really honorable and respectable place. So I plan on just allowing Feel to talk to y'all and get that knowledge out and uh, just have a really great time enjoying some of the original examples uh, of John Browning's guns. I mean, this is incredible and when I'm, I'm literally shaking. I'm so excited to be here and to talk about John Moses Browning uh, and to show y'all just the wonderful mind that, that he had and, and how he came up with some of the greatest guns uh, of all time. So without uh, any further ado, and I'm getting just all jacked up right now, even thinking about it, let's head on up. He's, he's there to greet you, Mr. Browning. Holding an A5 shotgun, uh, you know, the trigger discipline isn't the best, but guess what, it's John Browning. Are you gonna tell him how to hold a shotgun? I don't think so. So we're here with Phil. He is a volunteer here at Union Station and specifically up at the Browning uh, level here, which we're just super excited to talk with you. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're here at the first case, which is some of the early Colt, uh, or excuse me, Browning automatic pistols. Uh, not all of these are Colts. And uh, so we just want to kind of talk about this and some of the development, early development, and um, kind of how that went, and maybe just whatever you have to say. You know, well, you're we, guiding we the have an, uh, an example here of the 1900 FN or Fabrique Nationale. This is the prototype, and this is a manufactured. In fact, this is a very special one. This is the one, the 100,000th uh, pistol produced. Now down here we got something very similar. We got the baby Browning. This is a prototype, and again, this is a, the Fabrique Nationale, and it's the one millionth. Oh, wow. Well, and you know, you and I were talking a little off, off screen here, and um, you know, I'm a big Colt guy, and I, you know, seeing the baby Browning, and then I have a 1908 uh, Colt myself, and, and we were just talking about that awesome deal uh, that the Browning brothers uh, worked mm -hmm. up between FN and basically divided the world mm -hmm. divided uh, when, the it world, came, yes. when it came to gun manufacturing. Yes. So. The, the only continent that wasn't really represented was South America, mm -hmm. and that was they kind of arm wrestled for that. <laughs> right, right, of course, yeah. of course. So you know, it's it's amazing to see the the the, the Browning designs on both sides of the pond, mm -hmm. and uh, in some cases not very many changes, in some cases a lot of changes. Mm -hmm. Um, but this is just incredible, and of course, you know, us at, at Alchemy here, we're big fans of the Colt 1903, mm -hmm. and so, you know, the, the development of the 1900 eventually led to the 1903, both FN and Colt, mm -hmm. um, and I think that's pretty fun that, that they basically made the same design a little bit different, mm -hmm. you know, and one went to, one went to Europe and one, one came uh, to the States, so uh, that's just a, an amazing thing. You know, we have another thing that I'd like to point out here is the Woodsman. Oh, yes. This is, you can see the legacy of this pistol in the modern day Brownings. Mm -hmm. So this is kind of cool. And well, and I have a 52 Challenger, Colt really? Challenger, okay. which is just, you know, the development. Of, and what a mm -hmm. wonderful 22 mm -hmm. pistol. Mm -hmm. I mean, every one of these uh, Browning d developed 22 pistols are just, gosh, Phenomenal. they are amazing yeah. guns. And that's that's a gun that I that really drew me to this case. Is now that, there's something I'd like to point out here, you guys. This is something interesting. That pistol um, is actually chambered in nine millimeter Browning long, which is a, a defunct cartridge. Right. Wow. Okay. But it, the reason I think the reason why they did that is because that you notice the slide how long it is. Mm -hmm. It has a certain mass to it. So it, it, and it it still retains the blowback principles. And that's why they did that. That cartridge was made for John Browning. That's excellent. I love that. And then we can see all the stylistic, you know, uh, features that would go on for the FN 1903. Yes. And then the, uh, the Colt 1903, obviously, with a little shorter barrel. Yes. Uh, but just wonderful guns. I mean, you know, we've talked. I, Browning was just, his the way his mind worked uh, was amazing. And so... Um, from here, I want to go over and, and start to get a little bit into the, the really, really fun stuff, which is the early Colt pistol development. Okay. So we'll walk over here, um, try not to get distracted by, 
just incredible firearms on both sides. So, you know, as I was saying, I, I love the early, the early uh, Brownings. I have a 1902 myself. That dual uh, link is just mm -hmm. really interesting. Mm -hmm. um, maybe not the strongest as it was, all, you know, got, yeah. got rid of later on, but just really interesting. And, and, and to see the, the progression here, it's really cool because even on this first experimental gun, we can see the, the groundwork for the 1911, mm -hmm. um, you know, and so the 38 caliber, you know, we might consider it an anemic cartridge, but it's really a, a pretty decent cartridge at, for the time, especially with a lot of 38 caliber pistol revolvers mm -hmm. um, at the time. So, you know, I, I just love seeing that this top ejection port, and then obviously they move it to the mm -hmm. side. Um, but, you know, just uh, these details are amazing. Well, the evolution, actually, this is in correct order. This is the first 1900 that he produced it as a prototype. Then this is the secondary one, and this is the tertiary one. Oh wow! So wow. this this progression is correct. Now I would like to point out that the the uh, the thirty eight ACP, I don't know whether you know this or not, but evolved into the thirty eight super. Yes, yes. Okay, it, which is a much more powerful cartridge Absolutely. Absolutely. than the thirty eight ACP. But the thirty eight ACP was a a pretty good cartridge in the time. I don't I, I don't think it was too anemic. Right. Not not like the three eighty. Right. 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 32 but anyway that, <clears throat> that what you have is a progression john browning invented this pistol in 1898 and uh you can see the uh, at the evolution now this does have the twin link again this still has the twin links all these have the twin links and twin link didn't disappear until i believe 1907 mm -hmm. i believe so i i think it's such a good look especially with the long uh full length dust cover here um, and then you have that crossbar in the front, yes, um, of course. But yeah, and and I do want to ask you these these like little spots of knurling. That was that the original look of cocking serrations. This like little yes, yes. oval and then yes. square. Yes, that what? was the cocking serrations. And then of course, I guess they made them. You know, they made made them much larger. But that's in, that's so interesting to see. Yeah. Now the these are fantastic guns and essential, of course, to the. 1911. These are the history. stepping stones. These are the early stepping stones of the 1911. Absolutely. Yeah. Beautiful, wonderful. Right, well, let's go talk about 1911. Okay. So now we're here at my favorite case, uh, besides the BAR case, but we'll talk about that in a second. And that's because we're talking about the actual 1911, the 45. Um, for all of y'all out there, you know I'm a big fan of 45, carry 45 daily. So um, we've got a couple of really interesting 45s that are, that are absolutely um, special to the development of the 1911. Then we'll go up into the into the 1911 and not 1911 that's right there. Um, so we have the two that I think if you really are astute, you're going to know. That's a 1905 Colt uh, with the hammer, and those guns were a product of the Army wanting to go to a 45, and that mm -hmm. was a product of the um, Thompson Lagarde test in 1904. 1904, yes. And so, but the, the one that's really interesting is the 1905 without a hammer. So mm -hmm. that's the one I want to hear all about because I had no clue that gun existed. Okay. The, the, the pistol he's referring to is the pistol right down here on the far left. And it actually is a culmination, I believe, of 1909. Mm -hmm. uh, if we can, there's a lot of features on here that point to the 1909. Uh, for instance, the one, the single point tilt barrel, that's one thing. And also the, the ejection port, that's another. Right. But there are things on this pistol that still point back to earlier times as the, the vertical grip angle. That still hasn't been changed. And that didn't get changed until 1910. Okay, so this pistol, uh, there's a lot of speculation. I, I can't tell you exactly because I really don't know, but I can speculate. Right, and I think that this was done as a as a uh, oh, as a test for the cavalry. And if you look at the if you look at the records, uh, the 1911 was actually adopted by the infantry, the army infantry in 1916, but not uh, by the cavalry until later. Really? Yeah. So I think that I think that that was probably because they were still trying to figure out what they wanted. Right. So this is this pistol. I think was actually developed for, for a test for the cavalry. That's that's amazing. I, again, when I walked up and saw that gun, um, you know, we immediately thought cylinder and slide, uh, cylinder and slide, a company uh, 
that does the same thing we do. Mm -hmm. They had made a gun similar to that, and so him and I both kind of latched onto that. But that is an awesome gun. And uh, real quickly, I do want to also point out that is the nicest um, 1905 I've ever seen. It's very nice. Oh, it's got the I mean, it's got the original um, Colt bluing. That that's a very typical yep. Colt bluing. That yeah, niter bluing is gorgeous. Oh, it's gorgeous. It's it's. I mean, it's very, I'm, I, I'm 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 a loss of words. What a gorgeous pistol. That that pistol is probably priceless. Yeah. It would be very very difficult to put a price on. Wonderful. And then we're going to move up now. We we do kind of skip a few steps, and that's okay. Um, but move up to this gun that looks a whole lot like a 1911, um, but isn't. And I th when I saw that gun, I started having heart palpitations because <laughs> I didn't ever think I'd see that gun in person. But I'm going to let you talk about that because that's a really special pistol. The pistol he's talking about is this this one right here on the far right in the middle shelf. That's a 1910, a model of 1910, but it's a prototype. This, this was not made for commercial sale. Uh, in fact, Colt only made eight of these pistols for trials. That's probably why you don't see very many of them out right. in the market. I think a whole lot more were made of this, this pistol right here, but that was never made for commercial use. So it, it fared very well in, in trials. And you know, I just, I love that gun, but, but can you talk to us a little bit about what was changed in, between 1910 and 1911 for those models of pistol? Okay, in 1910, we still had the, the, the side plate retainer. If you can see that on, the, on this, this close side, that has a, that's a retaining for the pins inside. Now, it also does not have a manual thumb safety, which did appear on 1911s when it was finished. Now, something that's kind of hard to see, if, can we yeah. move down here? Uh, if you look at the, the guide rod on, the, on the, the, the face of this pistol, it's very small. Now, in, in subsequent years, that was increased in diameter. If you compare that to, to a 1911, you can see the difference in the diameter. Now, one, one thing, and you, and you may not know, and that's fine, but one thing that I find really interesting on the 1910 is this like little cut on the front going into the, into the front sight. Mm -hmm. Do you know what that came from? I, mean, I have I, no idea. I've never I really seen don't, that. I really it looks don't fantastic, know. though. It's just John Browning's mind. <laughs> I'm sure. I'm One of the sure. things that I, I would like to point out is on this, this 1909 uh, concealed hammer model, you notice that the ejection port is on the top. And John Browning did that in one year only, and that was in 1909. As you can see, in 1910, they moved it back to the right. As I understand it, it, was, it did cause issues with ejecting. Ejection. You know, yeah. And then, of course, um, to finish us up, we're going to finally get to the 1911. And interestingly enough, uh, two pretty rare 1911s, early pre-transitional guns. Mm -hmm. Looks like a Remington UMC, and mm -hmm. then, of course, the Springfield Armory. Uh, and, and this is where we'll educate some customers here, because, of course, we're not talking about Springfield Armory as it's known today. Right. Um, so, you know, a lot of people don't realize that there were several other manufacturers of mm -hmm. the guns for the for the United States military at least. Mm -hmm. um, commercially, I believe, and correct me if I'm wrong, commercially I believe Colt was the sole producer for the guns on the commercial market. Right. Um, but for the military it was several different manufacturers. Oh yes, yes. We had, you know, union switch and signal now. We, we're going up to, in time, we're going up to the 1911 A1. Mm -hmm. okay, that's a little bit, a little more modern than this pistol here. But in that in the World War II vintage, we had Union Switch and Signal, and we had, oh, I, I drove a blank. Remington place. Rand? Remington, I've, got a, I've got a Remington Rand. Remington, Remington Rand, Rand, we had Springfield, there. we had, what's that really, um, that um, rare one? Uh, Singer. 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 Yep. Yes, we Singer. had Singer, and there was actually one more. Well, there's Ithaca. It's not Ithaca, rare. But the quality was not very good. <laughs> well, the quality was, was horrible. Well, we've talked about that for sure. Have you? Yeah, you know, the. Well, I've got a Remington Rand, and, it, and you, you hold that, and you think, well, I paid a couple thousand, you know, a few thousand dollars for this gun, and you compare it to, like, you know, one of our you know, hand built guns, mm -hmm. and you're like, man, this is. The quality's not there, but the historical provenance is right. absolutely what makes that gun worth that. But. Um, you know, I think it's interesting that Browning was just very, and again, correct me if I'm wrong, he seemed very um, patriotic in the sense that he wanted his designs to be uh, produced in, in, the, in mass numbers to arm sure. uh, our, our soldiers. Right. Uh, you know. But we really didn't get the, the mass quantity 
of firearms until we got to the 1911. Right. Then that was they were then they were, they were uh, produced in mass. Wonderful. I mean, just an absolutely gorgeous gun, and and you know the even history. more that we got even more production on the 1911 A1. Right. That was even bigger production run. Right. They're they're so amazing. Well, let me. I'm going to ask you a question. Yes, this sir. is t totally uh, you know your 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 opinion. 1911, 1911 A1. Which one do you like better? Well, I personally kind of like the 1911, oh, the, the original. Me too. Me yeah, too. I, I do. I know there's there's a lot of issues about the beaver tail. Yep. And, oh, it'll tear you up. Well, <laughs> I still like it because that's what John Browning designed. Exactly. I'm, the same I'm a way. purist. You know. I'm the same way. I've got several, like I told you, pre-transitional models. Mm -hmm. uh, and for those of you who don't know. The 1924 was the uh, year that they did a lot yes. of the A1 transitional yes. periods, but the guns built in that time were considered transitional model cold. It's very expensive gun. True. <laughs> very True. expensive guns. And, uh, you know, there were several uh, updates made. But so we love 1911s. Yes, but sir. All the Brownings, every one of them are amazing. And, and this place doesn't just have 1911s, does it? Nope. In fact, you have my second favorite gun ever. In fact, the first of my second favorite gun ever. So let's walk over here, and I'm not going to bog you down. I'm I'm going to just sit back and enjoy this. Um, this right here, and I'll let you get close. And I just the BAR. What we have here is the the, the prototype of the Browning automatic rifle. This is the this is the very very first rifle that was made by John Browning and brothers. And then the rifle we see here on the bottom is the rifle that they actually used in 1917 trials to sell to the military. And as you can see, this rifle is still under development because it ejects the case from the top rather than the right hand side. And you know, we, we talked a little off camera. The BAR, I have a super big soft spot for it, but what a gorgeous combat rifle. Very I mean, they're so. just a beautiful combat rifle. And we've talked that they shoot fantastic. They're so soft recoiling, especially considering the cartridge, you know, mm -hmm. the 30 out six cartridge. So these are just epic. And then of course, I, you know, in my opinion, the BAR really led the way. A lot of people might argue the Sturmgewehr or the STG 44, mm -hmm. but I think the BAR was really when, when military started saying, hey, having um, a lot of firepower in for one soldier to carry versus a crew, crew, uh, you know, crew operated machine mm -hmm. gun. That's kind of, that's going to be the ticket. You know, there's a lot of, a lot of things about this BAR that many people don't realize. Many BARs have bipods yeah. on the front of the, the barrel, but this rifle was actually designed in part as a, a, a walking firearm. The operator had a belt that would go around his, yep. his middle. And you have the buttstock that go in here, and he could. It was called suppressive fire. Yeah, that's what this was designed for. I have actually shot with BAR in the cup, mm. and it is a. It, it, you know, especially when we're used to this modern, you know, mm -hmm. action of shouldering a firearm. Mm -hmm. That is a really interesting mm -hmm. way to shoot a gun, uh, and just the, that's just so amazing. But you know, as amazing as these automatic rifles are, and I, and I would say as, as much as he did pumps and lever guns, John Browning's the, the king of the automatic I agree. Uh, weapon. We have to talk about when he first came up with that sort of automatic um, design in his head. So I think that's this gun right here. Yes, this gun right here, this would be the, the very first concept that John Browning came up with as far as an automatic weapon. This tr is truly an automatic weapon if you load the magazine and you, you charge the weapon and you keep your finger on the trigger, it'll go boom, 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 boom <laughs> until the magazine is depleted. And how it does that is that as, the, as the projectile is going down the barrel and goes out the end, there's a lot of hot gases that are still being behind that bullet. And it flips this, guy, this flapper down and this rod cocks the rifle. And just... I mean, I could never have thought of something like well, that. Well, John Moses Browning was a genius. He was. Uh, There's there, no question about it. And uh, his mind worked differently. And, uh, un, and fortunately for us, there were no distractions like TV and, <laughs> and internet and right. <laughs> cell phones. <laughs> no, this is wonderful and wonderful to see. And, you know, I, I, the next gun in this lineup, I think, and we talked again, is even more important, but mm -hmm. not for Americans. Mm -hmm. um, so I, that one's over here, isn't it? Yes. 
And I'll you let like, you lead okay. the way. I was absolutely shocked when I saw this gun and you started explaining things. This rifle is the next iteration of the rifle we just looked at. It still uses the same gas propellant down the barrel. The bullet, there's a, a port right here at the end. And as the bullet passes over that port, the force of the gas comes straight down and flips this flipper out and cocks the rifle. This is the next iteration of the one we just looked at. And now this rifle is very important because this rifle was studied by none other than Mikhail Kalishnikov before he created his own rifle, the AK-47. The AK-47 still bleeds the burning gases a little bit differently, but they still use the same principle. That's incredible. As, as well as even rifles that were designed by other manufacturers like eight, like Stoner, they still bleed gas off the barrel. They're just right. a gas impingement system. And so Browning, to reiterate, Browning actually was the first to bleed the gas off the yes. barrel. Yes. That, that concept yes. was his. Yes, indeed. And, and that's, the, that's the way we think a semi-automatic or an yes. automatic rifle just works. Yes. And, you know, I actually didn't know that. I think that's wonderful. You know what, Phil, you have, this is amazing. Um, I I'm really, glad you appreciated it. I, I really appreciate this. I appreciate you uh, talking through us. And mm -hmm. of course, folks, you, this is a fraction of what they have here. Uh, and they also have a car museum, which I love cars. So yeah, I was really, I was really yes. excited about that. So um, please, if you are in Utah, and even if you aren't, just come here. This is something that if you love a 1911, if you love John Browning, if you love the A5, if you love the Remington Model 8, if you love most of the greatest <laughs> rifles and, and shotguns and pistols, um, this is where you need to go. Now, as Eli mentioned, we have cars in this museum also. We have railroad memorabilia. Oh, yeah. yep. We have Western memorabilia. Oh, yeah, everything. But we like to think that this is the best part of the, the depot right here mm -hmm. in, in the Browning Firearm Museum. I would of course, agree. I'm a little partial. <laughs> well, thank you, Philip, so much You're for welcome. your time and yes. for and, and especially for the city of Ogden for, for preserving this. Yes, yes. Um, this is so important. And one of the big things we talk about um, at our company, Alchemy, is the importance of the next generation um, getting into the 1911 and, and other Browning designs. You know, I'm 25, and among 25-year-olds, the 1911 is not maybe the most popular gun, um, but we are doing a lot to really rectify that issue. You know, can I th throw something in here, Eli? Sure. Yeah, of course. You know, Eli made me think of something just now, that the, even though the 1911 is, is getting very old by this time, there's no other gun manufacturer, if you're shooting short action, breech lock design, right pistols, they're all based on the 1911 concept. They accomplish it a little bit differently. I don't care whether you're shooting Glocks or AKs, not AKs, uh, uh, FNs or SIGs, what, it doesn't matter. They're still based on the short action breech lock design. Isn't that amazing? It is. It is. And we are we are so blessed that the 1911 is still in production. We are, we are so proud to be carrying on that lineage in our own company. Mm -hmm. um, so, again, thank you so much for having You're us. You're welcome. Um, thank My you, pleasure. Thank you for, for being here. Thank mm -hmm. you for your, your knowledge. And, uh, you know, we are going to just sign it off. I, 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 we'll get stuck here for hours uh, if, uh, if hours, we don't yes. end it up. But thank you all for joining thank us you. today. All right. And uh, come and see the museum.